The views and opinions expressed on Reasonably Speaking are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the policy or position of the American Law Institute or the speakers' organizations. The content presented in this broadcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered legal advice. Please be advised that episodes of Reasonably Speaking explore complex and often sensitive legal topics and may contain mature content. Welcome to Reasonably Speaking. In this episode, we'll be exploring the death penalty in the United States. For this episode, I had the pleasure of speaking with three people who have been at the front lines of the death penalty debate. In one interview, I spoke with Brandon Garrett, the inaugural L. Neal Williams, Jr. Professor of Law at Duke University School of Law. Brandon's book, End of Its Rope, How Killing the Death Penalty Can Revive Criminal Justice, examines the implications of the decline of the death penalty. It was published in the fall of 2017 and has been hailed as indispensable reading for an understanding of the dramatic, ongoing changes in the role of capital punishment in America. In a separate interview, I spoke with Roberta Cooper Ramo and Christine Durham. Roberta is a shareholder at the law firm Madral Sperling. She served as the American Law Institute's president from 2008 to 2017. As ALI's president, she oversaw the annual meeting proceedings when the Institute's membership voted to withdraw the death penalty from the model penal code. Christine Durham served as a justice on the Utah Supreme Court from 1982 to 2017, serving as Chief Justice from 2002 to 2012. She's an ALI Council member who served on a special committee on the death penalty, which was assembled to help ALI navigate the issue. Let's start with Brandon. So Brandon, thank you so much for making time to do this with me today. So I want to start with your book, um, End of Its Rope. Read a lot of reviews, and a lot of people are saying it's the definitive book on the state of the death penalty in the U.S. today. Can you give me a little well, bit of background? Why uh, I had did you become interested in that subject? Large-scale death penalty studies as a law student. That was part of what made me interested in doing law and criminology type work once I became a law professor. And uh, as a law student at Columbia, I worked with Jim Liebman and Jeff Hagan and Valerie West, helping them to code data for what became the broken system studies. And those studies showed that about two-thirds of death sentences in the modern era since the 1970s had been reversed for all sorts of different errors. So they showed that this massive error rate effect, and that, that was why they called the system broken, that death sentences were being overproduced in vast numbers. There weren't many political incentives not to seek the death penalty if it was popular in your county or state. But down the road, they would all get reversed, and very few people would ever get executed. And so that's where things were as a law student in the late 90s when death sentencing was at its modern height. And you know, none of, none of us, you know, my, my professors, death penalty advocates at the time, none of us turned to each other in 1999 and said, okay, this is the inflection point. From here on out, the death penalty is going down, down, down. Um, I don't think people were thinking of that in the big debates at the ALI over uh, the statement on the model penal code uh, provisions dealing with, the, with capital punishment. Uh, but that's what was happening, and over the last almost 20 years, death sentencing has continued to plummet in this country. Uh, once I saw that that was happening, I realized this is something that needs to be studied. This is a, a remarkable trend. It's not something that people expected. It doesn't really fit with like a Supreme Court legal perspective because the courts haven't done anything to really sharply restrict the use of the death penalty, although they've whittled it down. And so that, that was the kind of puzzle that made me want to write the book. It was a who done it, who killed the death penalty, why are death sentences falling, and what are the implications for criminal justice more broadly? Brandon mentioned to me the model penal code and the debates on the death penalty that took place at ALI. He's referring to ALI's project to update the sentencing provisions of the model penal code. In order to understand why this is important, we have to take a look at what the code is. After its initial publication in 1962, the model penal code was implemented in at least 37 states in whole or in part and courts continually rely on the code when a state's criminal code does not provide guidance. Roberta Cooper Ramo and Christine Durham will now tell the story of how ALI came to remove the death penalty from the code. The first voice you'll hear is Roberta. I think uh, there are two parts of this that are really important. The first part is the ALI process that happened, uh, and then how we got to the decision is obviously uh, very impactful for the world of criminal justice. But I do think the process is really important. And Christine, I think, was on the original committee, as I was too, that took a look at it. So do you want to talk about how this came uh, to be on all of our plates? Well, it is an extraordinary moment, I think, 
and you're absolutely right about process, but one of the things that interests me is that this was out of the ordinary for process. This was a time when the model penal code was being examined for revisions, et cetera, et cetera. And the reporters came back to the council and said, we are completely unable to deal with the death penalty portions of the model penal code. It's just not, not something we're expert in. And so the council had to struggle with the issue of how to deal with the death penalty. And that's when the initial discussion started. And then, of course, a motion uh, was made to the Institute to eliminate the death penalty, to reject the whole idea of the death penalty. So the Institute and the council were then faced with the question of what kind of process do we need for this? And that's, that's I right. agree with so, you that so, it was very so to important. to go back in history and just uh, re-say what you said a little bit. So we had agreed to discuss and revise the 1962 version of the model penal code. Correct. Uh, and the sentencing portion, uh, but not to deal with death penalty because Christine is 100% right. The reporter simply said, this is not our expertise. So in the context of an annual meeting to discuss the sentencing project, two very important law school professors, Roger Clark and Ellen Podger, and this is really a key point, they actually called Mike Trainer, who was the president of the ALI, and told him beforehand that they were going to move to uh, remove the section dealing with the death penalty on the floor of our annual meeting. Uh, and he told them what he was going to do then after a discussion with them. And what they agreed was that they would make the motion, but because we really had done no study about this at all, uh, what he would do is table their motion with the understanding that a committee would be appointed to look into how we should deal with that section of the model penal code in the way we always do, and that is based on study and discussion. And Christine, why don't you take it from there because you were on that committee. Yes, the original committee that Mike Trainer appointed was headed up by Dan Meltzer, a professor at Harvard. And it was a very small committee, as I recall. I think there were only like 10, maybe maximum 12 of us on that committee. And we, we undertook question on the table, so to speak, no pun intended, was the tabled motion uh, on what to do with this. And precisely what happened was that the Meltzer committee came back to the council and the executive committee with the notion that a much more extensive status report on the death penalty, a status report on the research, the current research, on current practices, on what was going on in the United States needed to be prepared. And you might want to pick it up at this point, Roberta. Great. So that everybody listening to this podcast understands, nothing is the official work of the American Law Institute unless it has been passed both by the council and the membership at its annual meeting. So we're a binary body. and both the council and the members are overwhelmingly composed of people who are not death penalty experts and didn't know what the status was. And so what the committee that Dan Meltzer chaired and that Christine was on was recommended to us is that we actually put together some sort of a small group of experts to at least tell all of us what the current status was in every way in terms of what the law was, what the practical right. outcomes was, what, what was happening to the death penalty. So what, what happened then was that Lance Liebman, who was then the director of the ALI, had to go find people who were academics, because that's what we do, who were expert in this area, and then form a small committee to do it. And he found brother and sister, Carol and Jordan Steiker, at Harvard and at the University of Texas who agreed to work together and with a small committee produce a report. So the first thing that happened is they produced a white paper that was then given to a committee that included a, it wasn't a lot of people, but it included all of the viewpoints that you would want. So we had state and federal judges who had to deal with death penalty issues. We had uh, federal prosecutors and a state DA. We had death penalty defense lawyers. And then we had a few people like me who were not expert in any of it, but as 
lawyers and members of the society had to understand what was going on. And let me just say beforehand, so people understand, in 1962, when Herb Wexler really pioneered the model penal code, what was said about the death penalty was really radical in some ways at the time and had an enormous impact on what was going on. So then there were no restrictions about the death penalty across the country. And the model penal code, this part I think was in, adopted in almost all states, had things like you had to be over a certain age, you had to be mentally competent. So it listed a whole series of things that were restrictions on the use of the death penalty, and that had been very successful. It was, and for example, the, the principle of proportionality, which was contained in the 62 version of the Model Penal Code, of course predated by not quite a decade, but a number of years, the United States Supreme Court's holdings in constitutional cases about proportionality. So many people described the original section on the death penalty as the intellectual framework uh, for imposing the penalty. And, and uh, Roberta's exactly right. It was, it was very much ahead of its time. And so uh, the, part of the reason that it's important to understand that is you can understand that some people were upset about withdrawing it because it didn't just speak about the death penalty. It limited in many ways the areas in which one could have a death penalty and that was a concern for people, that if we just withdrew it, then people would think that we would go back to the days before that when you could have the death penalty for mentally incompetent people and other people. But there was a very significant distinction that the council had to grapple with, and eventually the institute had to grapple with, and that was the distinction between opposing taking a vote that would indicate opposition to having the death penalty at all, versus merely withdrawing structural provisions contained in the 1962 Model Penal Code. And as a former state Supreme Court justice, I can say that that was a really important distinction for members of the Institute and the Council who were, in fact, state judges in many states who had to run for election and so on. And for them to engage in a vote to oppose the death penalty could have had serious political ramifications, and so that issue played into the debate. I think the other point that it's important to make, which is along those lines exactly, is that the American Law Institute looks very strongly at what the law is. And there was then, and there is now, the death penalty is constitutional, according to the United States Supreme Court. And so some people felt that that's what the Constitution allows as a punishment, and therefore there should be a way of dealing with it in the model penal right. code. So the so. Institute had, had the same problem as some of its judicial members. Right. And Roberta, you did preside over this. So can you do me the favor of painting the picture of that room at the annual meeting? Let me restate again what was in front of the body. So in front of the body is the simple motion that the section that dealt with the death penalty be removed from the model penal code in its newest iteration. That was it. And I want people to visualize this because I will never forget this as long as I live. I am standing in the ballroom of the Mayflower Hotel. The Mayflower Hotel has a balcony that almost looks like an opera house. Goes all the way around the room. All the way around the room. And then there's the floor, but then there is a little almost like mezzanine, slender mezzanine part that's about four steps up. And as we assemble, there are literally people hanging over the rafters. Uh, I don't ever recall, I was my first thought was, don't anybody call the fire department because I am quite sure whatever is allowed in this room, this is not it. And don't anybody fall off the balcony. And, no, or down the steps. So, I, so uh, there was some concern that I had about the physical safety. What is so enormously important as the first thing that happened is I asked Paul Friedman, who was then chair of the committee that had overseen this, 
to come explain the process that we've just explained to you to the group that was there. And we had provided everybody with this white paper that had been simply given to the council but had not been approved because that wasn't what, it was informational only. And it was very clear immediately there was a little bit of discussion. People started lining up. Uh, really on both sides of the issue. And just to give you an example, for example, some people thought that for treason, there ought to be the death penalty. I mean, they felt, and and this was especially true, I would say, of people who had lived through World War II. I think that's uh, right. You know, then had had very strong feelings about that. Uh, Obviously, there were people who were against the death penalty for moral reasons, but it was constitutional, and so Morality was not so much a part of uh, the discussion. And very shortly after the discussion began, um, a lawyer got up and moved an amendment to the motion on the floor. And the amendment was related to the white paper, because in the white paper itself, there were all these statistics that showed a lot of things, including racial disparity, both in terms of who um, was given the death penalty and in terms of the victim. If the victim was white, there were different uh, statistics than if the victim was not white. And it it was a a quite um, short but impressive paper about the reality of the death penalty as it was being enforced in the United States. In addition to the actual, for example, racial bias, the research done by the Stikers demonstrated the randomness of the application of the penalty and the fact that there there was simply no way to make sense out of the way the penalty was being imposed. And many people who were public defenders who across the country who had had to defend people in death penalty cases also spoke very eloquently about the complete lack of resources. About, I remember one man saying he was not even allowed in defending his client to call a psychologist who would have testified that this client was clearly mentally incompetent and there was no money to allow that to happen. So there were sort of story after story about that. On the other hand, uh, there were judges who had presided over death penalty cases who felt in their court there had been a fair process. There were prosecutors who, again, felt very strongly that they had behaved properly in death penalty cases. And overlaying over all of this, of course, was the fact that the death penalty is still constitutional in the United States. So we had in front of us a motion. And although at first the motion, as I recall, was to attach the white paper, it ended up being, after a lot of discussion and back and forth, the motion ended up being that the motion to withdraw the death penalty have the additional words, which is that the death penalty was being withdrawn because in light of the current intractable institutional and structural obstacles to ensuring a minimally adequate system for administering capital punishment. That was major. (laughs) That's what, after a lot of back and forth, that ended up being what the amendment was. Now, let me say something, especially in context of current times. I have never been more proud of an institution and of being associated with an institution than I was during that discussion. People had very strong feelings on all seven sides of the argument. Right. I mean, truly strong feelings, including many people who felt that the death penalty was something that modern society should find abhorrent. And other people who, as I said, felt either that they had presided over fair trials or that there were some crimes so heinous that the death penalty was appropriate. Everyone was respectful. There were no ad hominem attacks. And everyone in that room understood what has been lost in so much important political discourse these days, and that is that there had to be a compromise. That if we walked out of there with nothing, we would have gained nothing from all of this erudite, 
and passionate work that had brought us to that moment. That's exactly right, Roberta. Uh, and I'm struck as you make that comment about that process. I mean, at the time, I think I took it a little for granted because of my experience uh, with people in the American Law Institute. But given the, the status of the death penalty and public feeling, I mean, this was 2009, and the penalty seemed still deeply embedded in the American polity. I come from a state which the, there was no debate on the appropriateness of the penalty, generally speaking, in any political terms. And yet it was an extraordinarily respectful and knowledgeable debate. People made their arguments and they cited their data, but they didn't disparage the motives of people on the other side. The good thing about these discussions is that you have this magnificent mixture of people who are experts in the area, people who deal with it regularly, including judges and lawyers on both sides, prosecutors and defense lawyers, and people like me who are lawyers out in the country who are deeply ingrained with the view of our responsibility to make the justice system in the United States work appropriately. And the comments from the people who don't do this work were as important to the debate as the comments of the people who were either academic experts or who dealt with it all the time. I think that's right. And in that context, the addition of the language referring to the current intractable institutional and structural obstacles was huge. I mean, that was a very significant compromise with uh, respective approaches to the debate. And of course, it became, it became the policy of the Institute once it was adopted, and it became uh, very significant, I think, in the response to the Institute's action. When something does become the policy, the position of the American Law Institute, that then relies on states, on judges, to start actually using the work. We know now, it's 10 years, we know now that that moment was a landmark moment in the death penalty. Could you have predicted then what you know now? Well, it's very interesting. I, I went back and looked, looked at a couple of things. I, coming from uh, my state of Utah, my prediction was it would have no impact whatsoever. And, and actually, in terms of its immediate aftermath, I think that's absolutely true. But I found a couple of interesting examples. Um, Adam Liptak did a piece for the New York Times and uh, Professor Zimring, I think it- Zimring, yeah. Zimring, My law school I think, at, <laughs> at Berkeley. Right. At Berkeley did an article. And both of them touted this as a technic shift in the landscape of the death penalty. But at the same time, so there was a debate about how this was going to play out in the States. And I, I think actually that the effect was not immediate and it was not tectonic. Uh, it was gradual and it slowly gained um, currency. I agree, Christine, that there are a variety of reasons that states have begun to abandon the death penalty. I do believe that our conversation and our work was deeply important to the beginning of conversations in legislatures all over the country. Roberta and Christine agree that the withdrawal of the death penalty from the model penal code helped start the conversations in legislatures throughout the country, but that there are a variety of reasons for the decline of the death penalty. Now we'll return to my conversation with Brandon to learn more about these reasons. So you include several potential reasons in the book for the decline of the death penalty. Um, will you tell me about a few of those now? Sure. Well, the first thing I had to do was collect an awful lot of data because, unfortunately, th there just wasn't good information about just who was sentenced to death in this country from the 1990s to the present. And the Broken System study that I'd worked on as a student had comprehensive data on death sentencing and down the road appeals and post-conviction outcomes for death sentencing in the 70s and 80s. But their data ends in the early 90s. And unfortunately, that's the time period when death sentencing re reaches its height. So there's just a ton of death sentences in the 90s in particular. And just getting the names and dates and counties and the basic information for those cases was a miserable chore. And I had a lot of help from law students and undergrads in that process. It's all available online so you can see the maps of your state's death penalty or the national patterns 
on this end of its rope website. But that, that needed to be done. And you know, it also just highlights something broader in criminal justice. Even for really high profile stuff, like who is sentenced to death in this country, we don't have good data. And so we obviously really don't have good data on lots of other things, like who is sentenced to misdemeanors. Or I'm working on some stuff now, you know, who has their driver's licenses revoked? Or uh, you know, what, how, what is the role that mandatory minimums play? Or who is sentenced to life without parole? We just have terrible data in our criminal justice system. Uh, it's no surprise to those of us who do this work but I think it's shocking to people on the outside. You know, really, we can't. We don't even know how many people in what states and what counties are sentenced to death. That that had to be collected by someone. It's not collected by the government, and it's kind of not. Um, so that that work had to be done first. Um, we then looked at a bunch of, and, and we meaning some more statistically inclined colleagues, uh, Alex Jacobo and a wonderful law student, Ankur Desai, and I. Um, worked on some studies looking at possible explanations for the decline. Uh, and uh, some of the explanations included murders going down, so homicide rates start to decline in the mid-1990s, just a few years before this drop in death sentences. Uh, a second possible explanation uh, was that um, life without parole is adopted in different states at different times which gives jurors an alternative to the death penalty. A third possible explanation was that uh, there's some different Supreme Court decisions on juveniles and their eligibility for the death penalty, intellectually disabled people in the death penalty. Another possible explanation were changes in defense lawyering. Uh, a third possible, uh, an additional possible explanation was some kind of an innocence effect. I've done work on DNA exonerations and wrongful convictions in this country. Uh, some had wondered whether uh, the, the, the press, the media, the impact of death row exonerations might, uh, might bring down uh, death sentences in the states where those happen. Uh, those are just some of the possible explanations. And uh, an additional explanation is that some states abolish the death penalty. And so. Uh, just a few days ago, we had Washington State Supreme Court say that the death penalty was unconstitutional in Washington. So maybe it's that you know more states are abolishing the death penalty. We have 20 states now that have abolished. Maybe that's part of the explanation. So th those are some of the main explanations that that people had suggested. And you know, by the time I wrote the book, people had started to observe that death sentences had had been plummeting, but no one really had a good explanation for for why. So one point that you make in the book that I found very interesting because. I think from somebody who has not been a death penalty scholar or lawyer on the defense prosecution side of anything like this, I think we think of the death penalty as a state issue. Um, yet you make the point in the book that it's not. It's not that Texas or Virginia, as, as two that you mentioned, are very punitive in their death penalty sentences. You say it's more of a county effect. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Sure. I think we, we talk about, like, is this the death penalty state? Is it not a death penalty state? You know, now, now Washington state is not a death penalty state because the Supreme Court just, just struck down their death penalty. Or, uh, you know, what, what, what does this state have the death penalty for? You know, Texas is known as, you know, the top death sentencing state. That's not true anymore. Now it's California. Uh, Virginia, where I lived, I just moved to North Carolina to teach at Duke. But when I wrote this book, I was, I was at the University of Virginia. Virginia had always been second to Texas in terms of the number of executions in the modern era. Uh, and actually, that was one of the things that sparked my interest in this book, because Virginia, the number two death penalty state, um, had no death sentences by the time I was working on this. Since 2011, there hasn't been a single death sentence in Virginia. And that's just crazy for people who have been watching Virginia for, for years. The idea that Virginia has just stopped sentencing people to death. You know, now we're almost at the end of 2018, no, no death sentences this year either. And prosecutors still seek it routinely. Uh, and what I saw was when I you know, I, I began this project just looking in detail at Virginia cases, reading the trials and capital cases. What I saw was that there were just a handful of counties that still seek the death penalty, starting around uh, the early 2000s. In the 80s and 90s, you could talk about Virginia as a death penalty state. Small counties, rural counties, the death penalty was sought and often imposed just all around the state. And same in Texas. But starting at the, in the end of the 90s, when this death sentencing decline begins, you see the death penalty just disappear from rural America. Uh, the poorer counties, the less populous counties, the rural counties just stop death sentencing. Uh, 
and instead the death penalty retreats to these larger, wealthier urban counties. And we don't think of like the death penalty as like a Mercedes, like suburban luxury item. And that's, that's what it is today. And so, um, you know, there are about a dozen counties that are reliably sentencing anyone to death, you know, each year in this country. Just a dozen counties. And, uh, and obviously there, there are thousands of counties. And so that's, that, that's, I think, shocking to people. We think of it as something that a big part of the country endorses. And in opinion polls, like there are a lot of people who support the death penalty. But the places that are actually doing it are just a handful of scattered counties around the country. It's interesting you mentioned California earlier. And when I was looking on your website, the county that caught my attention was Los Angeles, which would fit that pattern that you're describing. Yeah, you don't I, think of like L.A. as like the uber red county, the tough on crime, you know, vengeance county. Um, but Los Angeles is now... Has, has, you know, these days, Los Angeles and uh, Riverside County, Orange County, these California counties are sentencing way more people to death um, than, than Texas. And you know, Harris County, Houston, Texas, had, had long been the number one death sentencing state, still the number one execution state in the country, but California has absolutely surpassed Texas, but only in terms of adding people to its death row. And it's unclear whether we should even call it a death row. I mean, it is a death row. People are, on, are facing the death penalty. Um, but California hasn't had a legal way to execute people for almost 10 years. It's incredibly unlikely that anyone on California's 800-plus death row will ever get executed. And the vast majority of them will get their appeals granted. They'll win habeas. Or they may die of natural causes or, or suicide long before an execution warrant is even in the picture. So. California keeps adding people to its death row every year, and it's unclear what the purpose of that is, since the death penalty is unlikely to ever get carried out in their cases. So I find one of your most compelling pieces is looking at the prosecution of these cases um, and the defense of these cases, and the idea that there's a better understanding now about potential mental health issues, um, but also it's not just the lawyers themselves. They're also engaging social workers to do this work as well. Can you give me maybe an old version of a case? I'm thinking your example of McCollum and Brown, the way something would have been uh, defended previously or prosecuted previously, maybe some blinders that people may have on in the past versus um, what you're seeing in these death penalty cases today. So the old version? Um a typical trial in North Carolina or Virginia or Texas in a death penalty case um, might last a couple of days at most. Maybe they take half a day to pick the jury. Uh, there might just be one lawyer, not two. Even though it's a double trial, I mean, you kind of need a separate lawyer to argue whether this person should be sentenced to death after the jury has found the person guilty. Uh, and today it's standard. You, you must have at least two lawyers on one of these double length trials. But one lawyer may not have any experience in a death penalty case, um, typically doesn't really call many witnesses. And even if it was like a person who was thought to be a good lawyer, good on their feet, they would just you know, show up in court and try to cross-examine witnesses. You know, they might not have any evidence or discovery in advance. They just show up and they're good on their feet and they try their best. And almost without exception, their client gets sentenced to death. Um, they don't, you know, in Virginia, it might be a, a witness or two that the defense would call at sentencing. Uh, maybe the defendant's mother would say, you know, it, it was a hard home growing up and, and sure he got taken away to foster care and there were some alcohol issues, but you know, he was always a good kid. And that would be it. Um, and then after that, the prosecution would put on 15 members of the victim's family and the medical examiner and, and images of the wounds um, and, and the person would get sentenced to death in a second. The jury would have no reason not to, not to sentence someone to death. And, and that, that's how the trials went in the 1980s and 90s in this country. That's how they still go in places where you have court-appointed lawyers, uh, states like Florida uh, and, uh, and in parts of California, too, where you just have a lawyer who shows up and does a death penalty trial. So today, you're talking a three-day trial, half a day to choose jurors. What does it look like today? What does that trial look like today? Yeah, so today, there's a team-based approach. And so some of the most important people in a death penalty case I talk about in the book are not lawyers, they're social workers. And uh, they're often called mitigation specialists. And so, you know, a lawyer, like in law school, we don't learn how to look at medical records and understand them properly. We're not trained on how to talk to victims of childhood sexual abuse. We're not 
taught how to talk to neighbors about abuse in the home. What noises did you hear? We don't know how to look up school records and understand what they mean, truancy, suspensions. We're not experts in talking to medical experts about alcohol abuse, drug abuse, uh, traumatic brain injuries. And social workers have that training. They know to have those conversations. And in a death penalty case, the client and the evidence of the client's background is key. Uh, maybe not at the guilt phase where the question is, did the person do it? But assuming they did, and, and you know, there's certainly innocence cases, and I talk about those in the book, but there are other cases where there's no question what was done and who did it. The question is, what kind of person this is? And given the person's background, are they really evil and, and, and they must be punished? Or, or are they less blameworthy because of the horrible things that were visited upon them uh, growing up? And to do that, you need a social worker, you need a team. And a team is exactly the approach that's used in states where you have, particularly where you have an office. It's hard for one lawyer to get assigned to a case, then you have to get a second lawyer and hire a social worker and experts and to build this team from scratch. Oh, well, a trial date is coming and the clock is ticking. If you have an office, you know, in some states, like in Virginia, they created capital defenders offices to save money. It's always cheaper to have an office than to have lawyers being billing hundreds and hundreds of hours and putting a team together from scratch. In an office, you have a you know, paralegal on staff, you have a social worker on staff, and uh, the offices do save money, but they're also more effective because they actually know what they are doing. And I think it's disturbing about the death penalty, which is that if you have a semi-competent and cheap team, then jurors hear the full story and they, they don't impose death sentences. And so in Virginia, when they created these regional offices, uh, and uh, for the four corners of the state. They, they start work in 2004. Starting the next year, prosecutors start losing half of the time when they seek the death penalty. The trials are no longer a couple days long. They average more than a week. And all of a sudden, twice the witnesses are being called by the defense as the prosecution. Most of the experts are now being called by the defense. Something is actually being done. It looks like a real trial. And when that evidence comes in, the jury hears an actual reason not to sentence someone to death. And most of the time, they rejected death sentences. So today there are three people left on Virginia's death row and we haven't had a death sentence since, since 2011. I like the recent story that you tell about the theater shooting in Colorado. Could you just case study it out? You don't have to take too long. So I mean, it, it was many mass shootings ago, so people may not remember it as well now as they did a few years ago, but um, this uh, man James Holmes walks into a theater in Aurora, Colorado with like every kind of large weapon and opens fire. Uh, 11 people killed, um, you know, many, many dozens more injured and some just incredibly severe injuries, quadriplegics. It's a, just a horrific scene. Um, it was clearly planned. He knew where the exits were. He had bought all these weapons. His apartment was booby trapped. You know, he told the police about that and immediately confessed his guilt to them. They then sent in like a robot to defuse all the bombs in his apartment. So there's no question about guilt. And his lawyers don't contest guilt. What they say is, you know, our client is horribly mentally ill. He's consumed by homicidal fantasies all day long. Uh, he's a chronic schizophrenic. Uh, and he clearly kind of, something had snapped in him like about a year before. He dyes his hair red. Uh, everyone notices him acting really, really strangely. He's seeing a university psychiatrist who says he's consumed by homicidal fantasies all day long. There wasn't anything specific, so I couldn't report anything, um, but uh, something really changed. And so the defense argues to the jury, um, you know, if you wouldn't wish um, schizophrenia on your worst enemy, do you kill someone for it? Is, that, is this person blameworthy given the mental illness that was consuming him? I mean, normal people don't have fantasies about killing large numbers of people. This is this is, he was in part out of control. Prosecution says, no, this is cold and calculated. Um, ignore all that mental illness stuff. Uh, he's not criminally insane, but of course if he was, he couldn't even be tried for a crime. And, you know, $10 million later, it was a many months long trial. They spent many months just on selecting the jury because it was such a high profile case. How do you find people that aren't intimately familiar with the facts? Uh, the jury rejects the death penalty. And many in Colorado said, well, if the death penalty isn't for this, you know, why do we have it? What was, what was this all for? And the trial didn't even have to happen. So the defense had said, our client will plead guilty uh, to, if, if there's a life sentence imposed. And, you know, eight or $10 million later, a life sentence is imposed. And so, you know, it's, 
far from a sympathetic person, and this is not one of the innocent railroaded people that I talk about. This is a case where everyone agrees a horrific crime was committed by this guy, and yet a jury of people who are selected because they absolutely support the death penalty uh, rejected that sentence. So I, I think that's a really telling example of what's happening with the death penalty. When you hear from the medical experts, when you hear the reasons why this is this person consumed with a sickness, a homicidal sickness, um, that that person is not as blameworthy as someone who truly was coolly calculated about what they did. To reflect on the title of your book for a minute, and if it's rope, I consider that the first part of the title. The second part of the title is How Killing the Death Penalty Can Revive Criminal Justice. So can you tell me, what does a future criminal justice system look like to you if there is no death penalty? Well, in some ways, the death penalty has been a weight on our criminal justice system. It, it epitomizes the ultimate punishment. In serious cases, the threat of the death penalty can be used for plea bargaining. And, and plenty of prosecutors will say that. They'll say, you know, we don't, you know, death penalty trials are expensive. Um, we don't necessarily want to impose death sentences. Um, we're not sure we need it to deter crime. You know, those studies, what few there had been, had been debunked. But we still like it because it makes things efficient. Because after all, that's how you get life without parole sentences. You need to threaten someone with a death penalty if you're going to get life without parole. If you don't have the death penalty, how are we going to get life without parole right and left? And in fact, that has happened. I talk about how death sentences are at a 30-year low in this country. Uh, we'll see what the totals are at the end of 2018. Um, but life without parole sentences have, uh, are at record highs. And we have 10 times more people serving life without parole than ever had the death penalty. And so that's one way we need to take the weight of the death penalty off the system. You know, our, our prisons are being consumed by lifers who will never leave prison, and that's why the, the population of lifers is ever increasing and filling up our prisons. If we want to talk about decarceration, we have to look at that group. Uh, if we want to talk about decarceration, we also need to look at lower level crimes, short sentences. Um, in our jails, there's enormous turnover among people who come in and out who are mentally ill. And uh, you don't need to have one of these teams to represent you with you know, full-time social workers investigating your social history to bring out mental health in a meaningful way in criminal cases. Uh, you can provide screening and treatment in jails and you can provide screening and treatment as an alternative even to arrest. Um, more agencies in jails are starting to do it, but it's really slow. Like in, you know, in some states, it's only been recently that they even do a basic mental health screener when people are admitted to jails. And in some states, it was even counterproductive because the person who now does that is the person who used to provide treatment. So they're filling out a form and they're screening people. Now they know who's mentally ill, but now there's no treatment left. And that's, and that's happened in, in rural jails. And so, you know, we, we, there's been a lot of talk about reinvesting the savings from reducing incarceration into mental health and treatment. Most states aren't actually doing it. They're just sort of cashing in on the savings. But the, these death penalty cases show in a really vivid way how when you hear the facts about someone's background, you can't help but treat them differently, even in the worst murders. And so, I, you know, I, I think we can bear to do it for shoplifters or people who are trespassing or people who fail to pay fines and fees because they're mentally ill and don't work. Right, these, these are cases where hearing about someone's social background is incredibly important and it doesn't happen. And you, know, you have huge numbers of jurisdictions across the U.S. where there are no pretrial services. There's no meaningful investigation into the person before they are you know, put on bail or just put in jail. And uh, we don't have to spend millions of dollars like in death penalty cases to do the bare minimum in regular criminal cases. So can you tell me a little bit more about the very recent uh, Washington Supreme Court decision? So just a few days ago, uh, the Washington Supreme Court found that the death penalty in Washington was unconstitutional under the state constitution. One of the things they emphasized was the arbitrariness and rarity with which it has been carried out. There have been only a handful of death sentences you know, over the past 15 years in Washington state. And that makes it look like lots of other states. I mean, death sentences have declined enormously across the country. It's rare that anyone gets sentenced to death anywhere. Um, they also pointed out that there's this geographic arbitrariness. It matters what county you're in or who the prosecutor is. That's true nationwide, too. Uh, one big piece of the opinion, though, uh, was the conclusion that it's not just that it matters who, whether it's a prosecutor that really likes the death penalty or whether it's one of these big urban counties, 
but they said race really matters. And death sentences were vastly disproportionately imposed based on race. Uh, you know, the, the defendant being black explained outcomes, four times greater likelihood of being sentenced to death, and they cited to a statistical analysis by University of Washington professors, and they said, you know, we don't need to say, like, how much racial bias means that the death penalty is unconstitutional. There's a lot of it here, and it's really disturbing. This ends now. We find the death penalty unconstitutional in Washington State. So uh, I guess my response to that opinion is that yes, and, and the same statistics exist across the country. In every state where it's been studied, uh, in terms of the death eligible cases, they found enormous race effects, particularly race of victim effects. Uh, kind of a white lives matter effect where white murders are much more likely, white, white victimization and murder is much more likely to result in the death penalty. In my book I describe how there's this close connection between murder rates and the death penalty. And that might make you think, oh good, you know, well, that's logical and you know, if murder rates go down, death sentences go down. And if murder rates go up again, maybe we'll see more death sentencing. Uh, but that's, you know, if there are fewer murderers, there's, there's just less supply. And that's, that's rational, there's nothing problematic about that. But when we unpacked that, what we found was that there was no relationship at all between murders where there's a black victim and death sentencing patterns in counties. There was just none. We tried lots of different statistical models. What we did find was that there was an incredibly powerful connection between counties where there are, there's white victimization of murder. So white victim murder rates really mattered to death sentencing. And there's a very strong relationship. We similarly found that there's just there's more death sentencing in counties that are racially fragmented, where there's a large black population but also a white population, and and so that um, it's incredibly disturbing. And you might think, okay, but that's you know that's probably because of like the '90s, and you had places like Houston and all these Texas and Virginia counties and rural counties in North Carolina and Georgia and Oklahoma, and those counties were all going wild with death sentencing in the '90s. But today, when you have like a couple dozen death sentences a year, it can't be like that anymore. Uh, and in fact, what we found is that the, the close connection between white victimization and death sentencing has actually increased. Like this racial bias effect has actually increased over the last 20 years. And part of the reason why seems to be that the death penalty has retreated to the most aggressive death penalty counties. A lot of the counties that weren't doing it very often just dropped off the map. And these are the counties that, that are responding most punitively to murders where there's a white victim. And that's, that's what we're left with. We're left with the worst of the death penalty. Not, you know, like a shrunken, tame, friendly version. Tell me, what do you think the future of the death penalty in the United States is? Do you see the remaining states going the way of Washington state? A lot of the focus of traditional death penalty scholarship has been the Supreme Court, and that's not my focus. Um, I don't see the U.S. Supreme Court doing what the Washington Supreme Court did uh, in, you know, our lifetime. Uh, it's, the death penalty has obviously not been a litmus test where we've asked you know, the new appointees, do you have concerns about race and the death penalty? Uh, and so I think there was some thought that Justice Kennedy might be open to striking down the death penalty and that there might have been enough votes a couple of years ago. Just as Breyer wrote this lengthy dissent in Glossop versus Gross, uh, citing to lots of scholars um, and he presumably wouldn't have done that unless he thought there was an opening to really think about the constitutionality of the entire American death penalty. Um, however, state by state, I do think that more state Supreme Courts will be confronted with the statistics and with the basic bare facts of enforcement. The death penalty is rare and it's incredibly biased in how it's used. And that's, that's not going to change. Um, there's going to be important litigation in lots of states, in Arizona, uh, California is going to have to decide, do we want to, at some point, they're going to have to build a new death row. It's full. So they're, are they going to spend billions of dollars uh, for a penalty that's not being carried out? So these, these costs are going to come home to states. Um, there are also states that are still reckoning with the legacy of death sentencing practices in the 90s. That's where most of the death rows around the country come from, because there's not very many people sentenced to death anymore. So the question is, do we want to pay to litigate these 1990s cases for decades? And, you know, in North Carolina, uh, where I live and teach now, um, the, uh, you know, death sentencing that happened in the 90s was under a regime which has all kinds of constitutional problems. And not just racial bias, but they had a rule that prosecutors were required to charge the death penalty for first-degree homicide. There's a real constitutional question whether you're allowed to require that. It's not exactly a mandatory death penalty, but it's kind of a mandatory death charging scheme. All sorts of constitutional problems. 
they didn't have the indigent defense support that they have now. Um, and so when you have like the death rows, which are mostly made up of these constitutionally problematic cases, most of which are going to get reversed over the years, you know, I think it's just a matter of time before states start to say, you know, what, what will Virginia say when, when you know, we're down to three people on death row? Either those cases will either get reversed or there will be executions, and you have no one on death row. So how much do you want to pay for a, a penalty that isn't being imposed anymore? There's no one on death row? What's, what's the point of it exactly? I, I see a lot of the, those states just fading away. And, and Texas even. Texas is fading away. We're now seeing, you know, like two to five death sentences a year in all of Texas. And so at some point, um, people are going to say, well, what's the point? And some of the main prosecutors in the country, main meaning like prosecutors in the counties that have traditionally been the, like the top death sentencing counties, are saying, what's the point? And so, you know, Larry Krasner, the district attorney in Philadelphia, has said, what's the point? But the new district attorney in Houston has said, what's the point? And, and, and uh, when you have the, these top death sentencing county prosecutors saying, we don't think there's any reason to do this anymore, then, then I think it's curtains for the death penalty. It'll be on the books. We'll spend billions of dollars on it still. We'll still have trouble getting lethal injection drugs. There'll still be botched executions. But more and more people wonder, what, what, is, what is all this for anyway? It's like a throwback to this era in the 90s when we, when we try to respond as brutally as possible to every crime, and we just don't do that anymore. Thank you so much. Really appreciate your time. You've reached the end of another episode of Reasonably Speaking. Thank you for listening. Visit ALI.org to learn more about this important topic and our speakers. Reasonably Speaking is produced by the American Law Institute with audio engineering by Kathleen Morton and digital editing by Kristen Evans. Podcast episodes are moderated by Jennifer Marinigo, and I'm Sean Kellum. 